Well, long before Eric Holder was the highest ranking law official in the nation, he was a trial judge in Washington. And he was known because he was such a tough sentencer then as Hold'em Holder. <laughs> But as more and more young black men passed through his court, he began to question the system and his role in it. He, he set out not to simply enforce policy, but to shape it. He blazed, blazed a meteoric and history-making trail as the first um, uh, African-American to serve as US Attorney General for the District of Columbia, Deputy Attorney General, and finally the first African-American Attorney General itself where despite a first term consumed by national security challenges, he never lost sight of his desire to address the inequities in our criminal justice system. It's a great honor to welcome him today. Thank you, good to, good to be here. Yeah. Well, tell us if you can, um, Eric, which you said I can call you, uh, about your journey from Hold'em Holder as the judge in Washington to the man you are, became uh, so concerned with criminal justice reform. What were the things that tipped you into that direction? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, um, I think that my role as a judge was something that was very dispiriting. At the time that I was a judge in Washington, D.C., uh, Washington was considered, uh, statistically, um, the murder capital of, of the country. Huge problem with violence. Um, and that, I think, is something that led to the Hold'em Holder thing. I had all these people in front of me who had committed violent crimes. But I also had people in front of me who um, had, were drug addicted and who were involved in the criminal justice system as a result of their, their drug problems. And I had an inability as a judge to deal with those issues other than to take them, sentence them, try them, sentence them, and then put them away in jail for what I thought were um, inordinately long um, periods of time. And I said to myself, you know, this is not who I want to be. And so five years into my time as a judge, I quit, uh, became a U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C. with the hope that I might put in place policies that um, would be more fair, more just, um, and have better outcomes. And uh, I, I brought that same spirit with me to uh, my time as deputy attorney general and then ultimately as, uh, as attorney general. Because it wasn't until President Obama's second term in office that you launched the Smart on Crime initiative to identify reforms. Um, why did you feel that the time was right in that second term that you could now go ahead and do certain things that you felt you couldn't in the first term? Well, it wasn't as if we were doing nothing in the first term. Um, I, I reversed the Ashcroft memo, for instance, in the first term that required all federal prosecutors to charge uh, the maximum offense that you could prove irrespective of what the, uh, the conduct was at issue, and we changed, we changed that. Um, the President and I have been talking about criminal justice reform um, for a good number of years, I think is what initially bonded the two of us when I first met him before, um, I guess right after he'd been elected uh, to the Senate, but before he'd actually been sworn in. Um, and it took time for us to uh, work through things at the Justice Department, uh, to have in place the things that I wanted to implement, and by January of uh, the second term, beginning of the second term, uh, I was ready to go. I was yeah, ready to roll. You wrote a memo, I gather, which was, you were asked by the president what was the top of your agenda, and you said that reforming right. the justice system was the top yeah. of your agenda. Uh, he asked uh, me to lay out what did I think about a second term, um, both in terms of the entirety of the term and what did I want to do in, in the short term. And at the top of both of those sections was, we've got to do something about our, our criminal justice system. Right. Well, of course, you also announced a very ambitious program to review the cases of literally thousands of nonviolent offenders. Right. But so far, only 184 sentences have been commuted and 66 prisoners pardoned. It was meant to be much more ambitious than that. Why so few? Yeah, and I think that is something that I would say that I'm disappointed in the number. I'd say the president's probably disappointed in the number as well. Uh, but let's not forget, the Obama presidency does not end today. There is still about a year or so to go. Uh, we're going to have a new pardon attorney. There are new processes that are being put in place in the Justice Department, in the White House Counsel's Office, where these things go. Uh, my expectation would be that you'll see a substantially greater number of people um, who will be the beneficiaries of the power that the president definitely wants to use. I mean, he's frustrated by the, the pace at which uh, this has been going. Well, of course, even if that does happen, though, uh, it's not going to make that dramatic cut to the size of the country's prison population. You know, last year I, I visited Greaterford Prison and I met so many offenders, uh, you know, who'd done hot-headed, stupid things when they were 17, 18, 19, and there they were, you know, since 1971, sitting there in prison. 
uh, in the, you know, the late 60s. So when will, is it going to happen that we actually think about grasping that third rail, which is to actually start to let out those offenders who were violent but no longer are violent? Yeah, that's actually a, 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 a critical, critical question. Um, in some ways, we looked at the, the low-hanging fruit and talked about nonviolent drug offenders who um, got inordinately long sentences and who need to be out of jail, and, and everybody kind of agrees on that. Um, but there's also the question of dealing with people who committed violent acts and who got really long um, sentences, some of which were deserved. You know, I'm, I'm a prosecutor at heart, and some people need to be in jail for really extended periods of time. On the other hand, there are people who make mistakes, and there are people who um, go to prison and um, rehabilitate themselves or have the ability to become rehabilitated. And that has to be a part of um, our criminal justice system, an individualized determination about um, where this person is. Um, is this person going to be uh, a threat if he or she is released? Um, and we've got to put in place mechanisms to maximize the possibility that more of those people can be, can be changed. I mean, you know, we, our system now deals with people who have all of these social deficits. They commit crimes, they go into the system, they're not rehabilitated, and then we put them back in the same environments from which they came, and we expect a different result, which is illogical. And we are shocked by the recidivism rates that, uh, that we have. So uh, we need to devote more attention, more resources to, um, to these issues. And we have to also understand that we do things in the United States that no other country does. Um, you know, we incarcerate more of our people at greater rates than any other, other country in the world. I'm sure you've heard this during the course of this day, but you know, we're 5% of the world's population, 25% of all the prisoners in the world are here in the United States. About 700 per, per 100,000 of our people are in jail. The closest to that is that uh, great civil libertarian, civil liberties country, Russia, and they're at f about 400. You know, we have so more prisoners than blown. China does. So. It's really mind-blowing. Of course, to go to prison in the first place, you have to get arrested. So, you know, we've talked a lot today about, you know, police conduct and about how uh, policing has, you know, the, 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 the fraying between the, uh, the African-American communities and the police. After riots erupted in Ferguson, you went there, I know. What did you learn there that you didn't know before, perhaps, uh, because you've studied this stuff for so many years, about what was happening and about the relationships between the police and black America? I think that what struck me about Ferguson was the, um, the uniform negative view that people had in that community, black and white, um, about law enforcement. It was striking not to have here almost any defenders of law enforcement um, in Ferguson. And then when we did that study that I called a searing study of, uh, of the Ferguson law enforcement community and found out what it is they were doing, which was essentially to uh, run the government, fund the government, by arresting people for minor offenses, traffic offenses very often, um, getting them ensnared in uh, payments, non-payments, warrants for arrests. Um, it became clear to me why there was that negative feeling. Um, and it unfortunately, you know, it is unfortunately, I think, that's an extreme example, but there is definitely a, the need for us to identify uh, the problems that exist between communities of color um, and law enforcement. And we have to face some hard truths. We have to also face um, some tough history. The criminal justice system in the past has been used as a means of social control. Um, and without that recognition and without the recognition of all that that uh, has engendered in communities of color, uh, we're never going to get to a place where we need to be. And I think we can get to that place but we have to be honest about uh, both the history that we've endured and the present that we must still confront. Have you ever experienced racial profiling yourself? Sure. I'm a black man. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I say that not to elicit um, <laughs> laughter, but that is a reality. You know, uh, my classic story is that I was running in Georgetown, and if you know Washington, D.C., it's a nice part of D.C., to get to a movie. It was late at night with my cousin, um, and we were running, and so police officers come by in a car, shine a light on us, halt, what are you doing? Now, I have the presence of mind to know, all right, I'm just running to go to a movie, these police officers, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, my cousin, by contrast, starts mouthing off, <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, you know, whoa, whoa, you know, let's not do that. Anyway, it gets resolved. Um, now, the only thing I was guilty of was being black, 
and running to a movie in a predominantly white part of Washington, D.C. The interesting thing was, at the time of the stop, I was a federal prosecutor. <laughs> I was an employee of a thing called the Public Integrity Section of the Criminal Division of the United States Department of Justice. And, you know, um, it was brought home to me in, in very, uh, a very stark way. Um, you know, you can be a whole bunch of things, but in the eyes of at least those two police officers, I was a black guy in a place where I shouldn't have been doing something that was suspicious, and that was running. Right, right. incredibly sobering. Um, well, of course, the march from Montgomery to Selma for voting rights was just over 50 years ago. I mean, considering the vigorous campaign to institute voter ID laws across the country and the Supreme Court's recent, of course, decision to gut the Voting Rights Act, do you think that we could be going backwards in America? I fear that uh, unless people of goodwill um, mobilize, I, I think that we can go back. These voter ID laws um, are, are really an attempt to retard the, the growth of, let's be honest, you know, the Obama coalition, um, which is you know, very scary to, to, to some people. This is a country that is, is in the throes of demographic changes, the likes of which we have not seen. This country is gonna be more brown in 2040, 2050. There'll be no majority race. Uh, 2043, I think, is the latest statistic. Um, the coming diversity can be a source of great strength for this nation, or it can be a source of great uh, divisiveness. Those who have come up with these new voter ID laws based on this notion of uh, voter fraud, which statistically does not exist, um, it's really an attempt to keep in place um, the status quo. It's an attempt to um, not let new people um, with new ideas, uh, new thoughts, uh, emerge and uh, to keep in place a system that um, has been in place for you know, an extended period of time. It's interesting to me that you see these voter ID laws only in those places where you have Republican governors and Republican legislatures. And I think the reality is that uh, they can't win the game, so they're going to try to change the rules of the game. Yeah, it's uh, absolutely driven by fear. In that mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, this morning we had um, U.S. Attorney uh, Preet Bahara, uh, Bharara with us, and he had something to say that he said we should ask you. So let's just roll that clip if it has. Six and a half years ago that he called me in November of 2009 and said that your office will be prosecuting Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Um, and then obviously for reasons that you describe and other reasons, uh, that, that didn't end up happening, and, and he's, he remains in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, in those six and a half years, we have, my office and the, and the great career prosecutors in my office with the Joint Ter Terrorism Task Force have convicted terrorist after terrorist after terrorist, including Osama bin Laden's son-in-law and a whole host of other people who were involved in acts of, of tremendous violence killing Americans over and over and over again, while I think Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is awaiting his first pretrial conference or something like that. Yeah. So, were you mad about that? Um, I was mad then, I'm mad now, and I'm not a person, who, I don't think, of great ego, but I was damn right, and the people who opposed me were damn wrong. And if Preet and I, and uh, Neil McBride, who's the US Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, if we had been allowed to do that which we said was appropriate, um, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and his Confederates would be on death row right now instead of waiting for their first pretrial hearing. The opposition to what we wanted to do was political in nature. Um, I will say that at least one senator, I have a great deal of respect for Lindsey Graham, and uh, he and I interacted about that, and I think he was coming from a different place. He had different views and yeah, different he had great solutions. respect for military courts because he had served on them, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that, that, that was right. But others, um, the, the mantra was, you want to hold or you want to give rights to these people, the same rights that you would give to ordinary American citizens. And for the life of me, I thought to myself, what the hell does that mean? Um, I, I want to put people in the best criminal justice system in the world, give them a fair opportunity to raise whatever they want in terms of defenses, and then hold them accountable. And plus, I want to do it here. I want to do it here, in New York City, where the um, offenses actually occurred. Um, and everybody was with us for a while, and then people started to put, uh, find jelly in, in, in their spines, not only at the federal level, but at the local level um, as well. And I think that um, the fact that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is uh, still sitting in Guantanamo, essentially thumbing his nose um, at the American people, uh, is a great testament to 
what happens when politicians decide to become involved in the criminal justice system. Wow, okay, now tell me what you really think. <laughs> okay. right. You so, didn't ask me to name names, yeah, I was well, ready to do that Oh yeah, too. okay, go. I was gonna say, my next question, Eric, mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, <laughs> who do you blame for this miscarriage of justice? Well, I, I will say that at least one Republican senator um, indicated um, that the greatest response that, um, that she got in her reelection effort was to say that, you know, um, this, this Bolshevik holder wants to put uh, these people in our criminal justice system and give them more rights than, um, or give them the same rights than any American citizen, whatever. And a number of senators said, yeah, yeah, I get it. That's a good applause line, good applause line for me. Um, you know, but I said, Lindsey Graham, uh, again, different views, but coming from a good place. John McCain, I, I would say the, the same thing. Um, others, Kelly Ayotte from New Hampshire. I, I think that her opposition was, uh, was political in nature. Yeah. And she's got to face the voters this time in New Hampshire. And I hope that the people in New Hampshire will ask her that question. Well, listen, the whole Gitmo thing, of course, continues to fester. And, uh, you know, you wanted to close it. We know that. Uh, isn't, I mean, here we are talking about our uh, justice system and how, all the things we want to reform it. But isn't, you know, Guantanamo Bay, uh, Bay uh, just a, a black hole, a terrible, uh, you know, offense against anyone who believes in justice? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the president asked me to... Uh, begin the process of closing Guantanamo. And what we did was bring together um, people from the defense community, the intelligence community, the law enforcement community, community and for the first time, um, look at all of the prisoners who were there and come up with an individual file on each one of them so that we can make recommendations as to what uh, should happen to them. Some should be released, taken to third, part, third countries. Um, some should be tried. Um, <laughs> Congress, again, in its infinite wisdom, put in a series of roadblocks um, and attached those roadblocks to the National Defense Authorization um, Act so that the president was faced with the, you know, the prospect of either authorizing the funds to fund our, uh, our Army, Navy, Air Force, or veto the whole bill, which contained these poison pills about Guantanamo. Um, in spite of that, um, the number is now below 100 or, or so. Um, I'm not optimistic that the number will be reduced to zero by the end of uh, this president's term, but it is not, I think it's wrong yeah, to it's say that Barack wrong. Obama failed as much as um, Congress, again, got in the way and for political reasons. Well, Hillary Clinton, I know, um, was very exercised about this, and, and uh, she, she said that she told White House aides at the time that throwing the president's commitment to close Guantanamo in, into the trash can was, was really unacceptable. Do you think that a Clinton administration, a Hillary Clinton administration, might be able to get it done? Yeah, I think that over time, the, um, the, the mood has changed, and I think that it really will take just more time. I don't think this president has enough time, but I think uh, another president who might succeed him and who's a, ha of the same view, that Guantanamo serves as a, a recruiting tool for um, those who would do harm to us, um, that it's a blight. You know, we have people who have been held there 15 years, 13 years or so, um, and who we, this committee that I put together has made the determination. They can be safely released. They can be put in other countries. Um, that we're holding these people. This is inconsistent with who we say we are um, as a people. A right-thinking president, I think, um, can successfully close Guantanamo. Well, you've said that the worst day of your tenure as attorney general was the day that you visit Sandy Newton. Hook. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sandy Hook, uh, yeah. after the terrible massacre. And of course, we just heard that fascinating and very, very enlightening and moving at times uh, conversation about guns. But you were shut down on guns really early in the Obama administration when you said that reinstating the assault rifle ban was a White House priority. According to Dan Kleibman in his book, Kill or Capture, Rahm Emanuel sent a message to the uh, DOI saying, uh, shut the fuck up about guns, okay? <laughs> Excuse the profanity. Um, Rom, you, uh, Rom used an F word? That's, a, <laughs> that's very atypical of, of him. Very yeah. atypical. So do you think that the administration, you know, should have pushed more aggressively on, in the first term about guns? I mean, was this another example of politics getting in the way of doing the right thing? I'm not sure it's politics getting in the way of doing the right thing, but I do think that, you know, in retrospect, um, we should have pushed harder. Um, and we certainly did push hard after the massacre in, uh, at Newtown in, in Sandy Hook. 
Um, and I thought, sure, you know, having been there on what was the worst day of my uh, time as Attorney General, that the American people, the people who represent the American people, um, would have said, this is too much, you know, babies, uh, six-year-olds, um, massacred in their, um, in, their, in their classrooms. And I think that if people had seen what I saw that day, um, these grizzled um, first responders, crime scene search officers literally crying, um, seeing the, you know, the classrooms with you know, the little posters that kids put up, what I plan to do this year in first grade, with the letters that are sometimes turned around, you know, it's a little very cute. And you saw the blood, you know, along the, um, the bottoms of the walls, blood spattered bathroom. Um, if the American people had seen those pictures, um, even the cowards in our Congress would have been forced to do the right thing. Mm. Yeah, but they didn't. Okay, so. <laughs> Were you frustrated in office uh, by, you know, these sheer, you know, the cowardice that you mentioned uh, a lot? I mean, you accomplished a lot, obviously a huge amount in your, in your eight years, but would you say that was the major thing that was troublesome to you? I think that's my biggest failure. Um, as Attorney General, the inability to put in place um, reasonable gun safety measures, especially in light of um, the mass shootings that we saw all the time that I was Attorney General, and in particular, in particular, what happened at, uh, at Sandy Hook. I worked very hard with Vice President Biden, um, met with really substantial numbers of um, people who were of the pro-gun community and who turned out to be extremely reasonable and who raised you know, issues that, uh, frankly, I had not thought about, about you know, transfer of guns between family members that happen in rural settings. You know? And you, okay, you wanna have people do this with some kind of interaction with the government. Well, there is no government you know, near us in Montana or something like that. All right, something we could try to work our way through. Um, but the inability to pass, you know, to me mansion, I mean, it is, from my perspective, um, a failure. That's a failure. Well, you don't have those kind of constraints anymore. You're now back in uh, private practice. Uh, what's going to be the focus for the rest of your career? And are you going to be able to stay focused on some of these questions that we've talked about today? Yeah, I mean, as I said, when I um, announced my resignation to the White House, I'm leaving my job as Attorney General of the United States, but I'm never going to leave the work. Um, the fight for equality, the fight for voting rights, the fight, vote, vote, the, uh, fight for a, um, a more just criminal justice system. Um, these are the kinds of things that animated my professional life and will continue to animate my life um, post-government. Um, and I hope it will be the kind of thing that will animate everybody's lives. I mean, you know, if we want an America that is true to its founding documents, it's incumbent upon all of us to demand that from um, those who we elect and you know, one thing I think the president said, if we talk about just the, the, the gun issue, um, you know, we have to start thinking about making that um, a one issue thing for us as we assess um, candidates. Where do you stand on um, gun safety measures? And if um, people are, you know, half-stepping or um, not strong in the way that they, they should be, they should not get our votes, you know? Um, and, because the reality is that on the other side, um, people have all these concerns about foreign policy, economic stuff, but they list as number one their whole, the whole question of what their representatives, how their representatives will vote when it comes to, uh, to gun issues. Now, I don't say we have to make it number one and to the exclusion of all else, but we certainly have to raise it um, in our consideration of uh, who we are gonna cast our votes for. And the reality is, you know, the American people support these gun safety measures by, you know, really substantial, really substantial margins. Um, even people who are members of the NRA support these gun safety measures. Um, and so it is time for the American people to raise their voices, use their ballots, um, fight for, you know, good voter uh, laws and protect the right uh, to vote, but then use that power um, for change. And, you know, and, and don't get, we shouldn't get, <laughs> awfully concerned about, you know, the money that, that exists out there. Um, you know, this Republican um, primary thing that we're watching <laughs> um, is a good example. You know, Jeb Bush has more money than, I think, anybody. 
and he's at like four or five percent. Donald Trump, you know, he, he's a lot, of, a lot of things. He spent little or no money, and uh, he gets all this free media, whatever, but, and he's, you know, by far number one. So the fact that the other side um, might have a great deal, great deals of money, um, can't stand up to what uh, we can do as citizens with the ballot. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eric Holder. It has been a huge pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you. Um, and thank you for everything you've done. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.